Welcome to the latest episode of the IA School of Thought series with me, Sai Kamau. This series is based on the IA book, School of Thought, 101 Great Liberal Thinkers by Eamon Butler, which, as the title suggests, summarises the thoughts of leading classical liberal thinkers on a range of issues and discusses them within a modern context. All the episodes in this series and all our other online content can be found on our YouTube channel, IA London, uh, on Podbean or on our website, ia.org.uk. Today, we're looking at two thinkers featured in the book who are usually considered together, Richard Cobden and John Bright, co-founders of the Anti-Corn Law League. And to discuss them, I'm delighted to be joined by Robert Colville, director of the Centre for Policy Studies, editor-in-chief of CapEx and a Sunday Times columnist. Robert, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the programme. Lovely to be here. Now, you've chosen two thinkers, uh, rightly so, that Richard Cobden and John Bright are usually thought of uh, as together as opposed to separately. Um, and and they're, thought, they're thought of together clearly because they were the co-founders of the Anti-Corn Law League. Now, why did you choose them? Did they have a, an impact on you specifically? Was it a subject that you've always been uh, historically uh, in, interested in? Uh, did they inspire you in a particular way or shape your thinking? What was it that made these two gentlemen stand out for you? Well, so I'm always uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for Victorians and um, and Enlightenment thinkers in, in general. I mean, I think one this country and and the the book by Eamon has a, a extraordinary heritage of of thinkers, and there are so many I, I could have chosen. Um, I guess I, I chose Cobden and Bright uh, because they, they are inspiring figures, um, but also they are they are extremely relevant today. Um, they're you know the the focus on um, you know, agricultural protectionism, free tra free trade, not just the sort of the importance of free trade, but the morality of free trade, I think speaks very much to where we are uh, as a country. And and the other thing which um, appeals to me about them is, uh, is that, you know, they're not just thinkers, they're doers. They are people who translated um, things that they believed in very firmly into um, practical policy in, in Cobden's case, uh, not just um, in terms of the, the Corn Laws, but also uh, in terms of you know, getting, a, you know, getting a treaty, a trade treaty with France at a time when, you know, Palmerston was making speeches, denouncing, you know, saying we needed to, you know, build, also build fortresses on the coast to defend against the French menace. So, you know, they are, uh, so they're, they're clearly people who, who engage with practical policies, yet at the same time sort of remain pure, as it were. Were. They always, they sort of they didn't compromise. They were they were both sort of uh, steadfast and devout, and I think that's a really interesting tension. Now, of course, we've, we're we're looking at these two gentlemen together, John Bright and Richard Cobden. But what do we know about them as individuals? About their background, who inspired them? You know, how they got to a position that they they found themselves in. Well, so so Cobden and Bright, for those who aren't familiar with the story, are essentially the sort of the parliamentary tribunes of um, of the anti of the anti corn law movement of the free trade movement. More generally, they are the sort of spokesmen of the rising manufacturing class. They, um, you know, they uh, they're sort of they're slightly different figures. Um, Bright is it comes from a Quaker family. Cobden was a was a sort of self made businessman. But they but they both end up as the representatives of the of the new industrialists of the sort of of the new way of doing things. And and come into come to Parliament with a sort of specific mandate to take on uh, to take on the establishment. Um, and they clearly had an impact in their lifetimes. You know, we, 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 but you know, we tend to look back at them now as heroes of, of, of free trade. Uh, but did it take some time for their ideas to gain traction? And what you know, and and you know, how did their sort of the way they are viewed change over time from the time that they were politically active uh, by the time they were successful in their quest to now? Yeah. Well, so the, the way I look at the way I, the, my sort of personal sort of handle on this is like Cobden is the man Jeremy Corbyn thinks he is. He was a man who to a remarkable extent stayed true to, to his principles, even though, uh, you know, his own reputation suffered. So actually, if you look at Bright, this at Cobden, for example, but it applies slightly to Bright as well. There's this enormous sort of, there's this enormous sort of um, swings and roundabouts thing that like, so when he is campaigning initially, when the, 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 uh, they are campaigning initially against the Cornwalls, they are sort of viewed with scepticism and, and scorn. When that victory is won, they suddenly, you know, they are among the greatest men in England, but, the, but, and are invited to basically sell out and join the establishment and don't, don't do it. But then, I mean, you Cobden's, uh, you know, he, he, the sort of lifelong pacifism, he was, um, you know, he was a, he he had this sort of touching and a uh, pretty well actually called quite naive view of, in, of the you know that the, there was two you know that we all we need all we all we need to do is give peace a chance. So he was um, you know so there was so there was a period when when Napoleon Bonaparte gets in and there's a sudden. Uh, 
in 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 England there is a sort of sudden a wave of like oh my god there's another Napoleon and he's the guy saying no 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 you know let's just be friends with them he is absolutely vilified and then a few years later uh napoleon the third is suddenly our best friend and it's the russians we hate and we're going to war in crimea and so suddenly everyone's going oh what a what a far-sighted what a sort of far-sighted visionary this guy is but then in turn um, he's he's also saying hey why, why are we going to war in crimea anyway so there's a consistency to their thought and their belief and you know bright um again who, who outlives cobden by, by some period you know he is um you know he on on home rule for ireland you know he again he sort of stands up to to the orthodoxy in his in his party. So you know, so there's a real sort of thread of moral principle going through their the things, and the, you know, and their and their reputations fluctuate according to how popular those those causes are. But I think today, looking back, you know, they, they are sort of unimpeachable, unimpeachably in the canon. Yeah, um, it's interesting you said what you say about Cobden. I mean, I'm a, also a professor of politics and international relations, and when I teach uh, students about international relations theories. Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at with some other classical liberals is, is there a particular classical liberal school of international relations and foreign policy? And how would you um, apply that to you know, contemporary foreign policy? And when you look back historically at the development of liberalism and how it's become liberal institutionism, people do look at Cobden, but they, they dismiss Cobden as being rather naive. That he thought that you could just have, you just, if you just have trade, that just automatically leads to peace and that trading nations don't go to war uh, with each other. Well, you know, that- the, yeah, the, the the more recent line, you know, no, until until the, until the uh, the Serbian crisis, you know, no two countries with a McDonald's had ever had ever gone to war with each other. Exactly. So it's it's, it's interest, interesting the the the, the uh, impact in that way. Now, how do you think? You know, since the time that they were, well, tell us a bit about the campaign and the, the anti corn law league and you know, that the way that campaign developed. But also tell us about the way that we the, the, the view of that looking back has changed. Uh, over time, from their own time to to uh, to to today. So I think there's a you know there's obviously an element of self interest there that you know these are these guys are you know have convinced themselves that they are in the right, but they are also the representatives of a class who will do very well after this policy change. You know they are um, you know they are they, they you know they will get you know they and their allies will will tend to get cheap inputs uh, for for manufactured goods and um but um and, and you know so so there's an element there. but 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 what what it, what interests me and what, what appeals to me is it like the the arguments they make i mean first of all the arguments they're making are just very very well made like bright is the guy who coins the phrase mother of parliament he's the guy who coins flogging a dead horse you know these are really you know he they, they are just very, they are very very good at communication um bright especially um, but they have a, you know, that the, what they sort of bring is, is, is this sort of moral argument that it's a moral and practical argument that they're not just, it's a kind of, it's a, and it's a development of Adam Smith in some ways. They're not just saying that free trade will bring cheap bread, which is the kind of, or, or cheap, in, you know, cheap, cheap goods for a, for, for a manufacturer. They're saying that, you know, that by having free trade, we will force our own agricultural sector to improve. So you know it, it, it is you know this is it's the uh, and obviously it's not a new, it's not a new idea. It is building on on what's been said before by other liberal thinkers. But it's you know, it's it's you know, this alliance and the awful coincidence of the um, Irish famine convinces the most powerful country in the world, which has built its empire on essentially mercantilist in many ways it built its empire on mercantilist protectionism. Essentially convinces it for about a century to. To convert to free trade, and that uh, you know, and that, uh, and you uh, and embeds that logic right at the heart of, uh, of of British thinking, and you know, convinces Peel to break the Tory Party in the name of free trade, effectively, um, which is you know an extraordinary, extraordinary sort of m- moment. Um, you know, the, the sheer power, the like the the power and logic of their arguments convince the Prime Minister, who admittedly is a kind of very rationalist Prime Minister and is quite unpopular with his backbenchers anyway but they convince him to you know that that this is right and this needs to be done and you know and then it's not until like joseph chamberlain um nick timothy's uh idol the, the, there's an effective and, and, and you know in a time when like america and germany are threatening to take away britain preeminence you know, it's not until then that there's really a, a challenge to that orthodoxy um and you know people quite often refer to them as the sort of the pioneers of the manchester school liberalism what do you think happened to that school o- o- over time well, one of the most depressing things about Britain um, is 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 that we lost that tradition. Um, you know, we we went from a situation. I think um, 
uh, I think the statistic is something like, you know, in 1900, nine, 90 pence in every pound that was spent by government was spent and controlled at a local level. By the time you get to the year 2000, it's 10 pence uh, is spent and controlled by, by local government. We become, over the course of the 20th century, one of the most, you know, the most over-centralized nations. And it's not obvious to me, or indeed to many people, that 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 was a good move, that that's kind of left us any better off. And in fact, you know, the whole leveling up agenda, um, which we've done work on at the Centre for Policy Studies, is is in some ways a react, uh, was a welcome and necessary corrective. The, the localism movement, which I was my, where I cut my teeth in kind of conservative thinking, um, direct democracy, that again, that was a sort of reaction to this, um, to this centralization. So we, you know, we lost that, we lost that sort of faith, and obviously this was exacerbated by the fact that you know the, 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 the our, our our industrial power did winnow, but we lost that idea of sort of proud and proud and resilient and self sustaining communities, which didn't really need London to tell them what to do, and in fact you know of having people in London who were the tribunes of those of those communities. Now, you know, as people who are you and I are clearly sympathetic to classical liberal ideas, we would see we would see both of these gentlemen as uh, heroes of free trade. But when we look back at their other views on other subjects, were they very much uh, men of their time? Would there be things that we would disagree with them looking back? For example, you mentioned the empire. What do they have specific views on the empire? Or will they still see, be, see, be seen in modern ter- times as quite in, having quite enlightened views on issues such as the empire? I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think of their contemporaries, they have, they have sort of come out quite, they would come out quite well. That you know, their their sort of their sort of idea of like a if I yeah, not not like a moral foreign policy, but you know they are, you know they're, they're that um, you know I, I think it was, I think it was the Palmerston when he tried to you know, he, they, you know when Palmerston made overtures, um, I I I can't so I can't remember whether it was Bright or Cobden, but it was one of them and said look no I'm not gonna you know I, I, it would be hypo- hypocritical for me to join your government when when you when I don't, don't agree with what you're doing so. I mean, oddly, you know, I, I personally, I, you know, I'd favour a more muscular on foreign policy. I'm, I'm sort of more muscular than that. As, as you said earlier, I think Cobden in particular was, was pretty naive um, in his in his utopianism. But you know, it's a nice it's a nice thing to be. You know, it's nice you know, if you're going to err, err on the side of of thinking uh, thinking good of your fellow man. Yes, and at least he's remembered for good reasons. You know, and and and, and, and you know, and, and free trade. Uh, if you like. Now, looking at the way that we look at them today, what do you think are for uh, classical liberals or free market conservatives um, or others who believe in the free market? Um, what do you think that we can learn from Cobden and Bright? And what do you think they would probably wish that we better understood now? I think it comes back to that point about about morality and about the the moral high ground that they were so so good at advocate at ex- so explaining and advocating. What for you know not just why these policies made sort of dry economic sense, but why they were the right thing to do, and I, I think you know one of the problems we've got is you know there's, everyone's getting get so swept up in like arguments about chlor- chlorinated chicken and you know uh, all the rest of it that it's just you know we've lost that sort of that golden thread. Of, and I, actually, Boris Johnson kind of gave a you know gave quite a sort of cob the night. Uh, like his speech in Greenwich, which I, I went to on free trade, was you know it, it was it was very much in that lineage. It was sort of reminding people that this is the this is the idea which has made like, has made more people richer than over the last century than, than pretty much anything else. And it's you know it's not only good for us in terms of just cheap inputs. It's good for us in because it kind of keeps us on our toes. Um, and you know you could you know I just I think. Um, that sort of self confidence, that that ability to reason things through, is just something that I I really admire in in in, in them, and I'd like to see you know, and I I, I think even if I'd been in it there at the time, I probably disagreed with them on a whole load of things, but just you know that that integrity that you know I mentioned Corbyn and Corbyn, the sort of parallels with, with Corbyn and, and and stuff. It's like you know what a degraded age we have when the like the person we think of when we think of an MP who has kept to his you know. Has, has kept to his principles throughout his parliamentary career is, is Jeremy Corbyn, who has awful principles, has never thought anything through in his life. Uh, you know, he, you know, whereas you know, Corbyn the right had a mate, had brilliant, you know, really much, you know, <laughs> yeah, especially on on trade. They, they, you know, they had a, they just, you know, they got it right, and then they, they had the courage of their convictions. No, and I, I'm not. We, you and I are, are not in the same room at the moment, and the re, one of the reasons for that is because of the, uh, the lockdown. We're in the you know, as a result of the pandemic. 
Do you think that they, there was anything that they said in their lifetimes that would have been relevant today or we should be looking to? Are there lessons that we could learn from Cobden and Bright about the, the government's response to the, uh, the lockdown? I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure that there, there, there are so much. I mean, uh, the, the, the thinker, like as I, I'm not sure how when this is going out, but the thinker who seems to be obsessing everyone at the moment is Mill. Um, so I, um, like, I tweeted a sort of fairly bog standard, uh, you know, Mill's harm principle um, uh, point yesterday, which is like, you know, my, you know, the liberty that is being infringed by wearing face masks is the liberty not to, not you know, <laughs> liberty not to breathe infectious diseases on other people, who, who in turn have the liberty not to be infected with a potentially fatal disease by you. You know, I, you know, I think there's, there are a lot of people who are sort of, you know, that they, you know, the, uh, the sort of um, hack, the sort of American version, you know, you, you know, your freedom to swing your fists ends at the point of my nose. It's, um, you know, I, so I think that's, that's the kind of, um, the sort of parallel from the, from the Butler book that, that, that I've been, I'm enjoying more recently, but, obvi but obviously, you know, I, I think in terms of not so much the lockdown, but the impact of coronavirus more generally, just if it, you know, what I worry about is, is if it leads us to turn away from free trade, if it leads us to conclude that, that, that um, you know, a sort of a, a more autarkic approach that some, you know, that in the name of resilience, we basically return to protectionism. Um, I think that is a real danger. And I think, you know, um, Cobden and Bright and Peel and all the rest of them would have, um, you know, Gladstone would have st stern words for us on that score. Yes, my, uh, as you know, my colleague Steve Davies wrote a book about the, uh, the history and economics of pandemics. And he said one of the uh, trends that you tend to see is a more of a criticism of uh, trade and migration because pandemics tend to travel along those yeah. those routes and people tend to become more protectionist and concerned about mi migration. And that's probably something to be concerned about. And as you say, you know, one of the things we've got to be aware of is when we look back at thinkers, we shouldn't expect them to have answers for everything. Um, you know, uh, we, we, just because Bright and Cobden spoke about free trade doesn't mean they'll, they'll be relevant for every single issue uh, uh, today. Uh, Robert Colby, it's been fascinating uh, discussing. If I suppose to sum up, if someone was to say to you, or I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it now, they say, you've chosen Cobden and Bright. You know, why in two or three sentences, what is it about them that stands up for you? you know, sell them to us. What's the elevator pitch? What would you say? Because they are the most persuasive uh, advocates for one of the best ideas in human history, which is that uh, when we trade freely between people and nations, we are all far better off. Uh, Robert Colville, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Can I thank you, our viewers and listeners, also for joining us. If you'd like to put more information on our publications, our webinars and our other online content, check out our YouTube channel, IA London, and our podcasts on Podbean. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk. Thank you for watching or listening today. We hope that you'll join us again soon. And in the meantime, stay safe.